All right, thanks everyone for joining us today. A uh, quick show of hands, how many of you all have ever designed the coolest XR experience ever that you were so excited about, you like reinvented AR, and then you tested it with your users and you just painfully watch them try to like press a button or just totally fail at trying to do something that you thought they would do. You're like, this is easy, why are you like, okay, awesome. Okay, great. Uh, that's exactly what we're gonna talk about today. My name is Jesse Escobedo, and I'm a senior product designer on Magic Leap's product strategy team, working on our platform and first user experiences. And today, I'm sharing the stage with Rocio. Hi, everybody. My name is Rocio Sergio. I am a UX researcher on the product research team at Magic Leap. And my work is basically in investigating and improving the experience of our Magic Leap apps and OS. Both of our roles are all about designing accessible, and easy experiences for all first time users. So anyone from super novice to somebody who's been using HoloLens and has just been here since like the archaic ages of XR. Uh, but today, we're gonna focus on sharing with you guys some best practices about how to empower brand new users to engage confidently in XR. And these experiences are coming from this learning app that we designed called Fundamentals, um, which teaches new users to Magic Leap 2 about all of the new XR paradigms. So let's dive in. As we know, we're entering the new era of computing, defined by spatial, smart experiences, powered by AR and AR, AR and AI. Magic Leap is at the forefront of this change, combining our industry-leading optics and amazing AR software. Simply put, we're unlocking more advanced and more personalized use cases that are going to change how we engage with technology in everyday lives. But we know that every time there's a new technology, there's always new tech modalities that present new paradigms and questions. Um, and this is gonna happen a little bit more often uh, as we have been designing our own applications and we're learning. It's hard to be teaching a new way to interact let alone trying to teach it in a simple way to our users. Our users think they're just gonna get it, but they simply aren't. Um, the reality is most new users are disoriented by these new modalities. And that's only gonna get more common as new products enter the market and we become more sophisticated about how we're designing our um, systems, like you know, Vision OS and their latest update, they're doing micro gestures now, right? Like muscle memory, like it's getting complicated out there. And that's only gonna get harder for our brand new users. So we have to take a step back, and as designers and developers, we have to think about that onboarding experience and how to bring users along. To design inclusive AR experiences, we have to take users on two emotional journeys. The first is from helping them come from being intimidated by the new technology to feeling empowered to interact with it. And the second is from feeling limited by the learning curve to feeling inspired to learn more. This is how we're gonna get users uh, confident in using AR, but also really excited about it. To put these principles into practice, we built a learning app for XR Basics. Um, the Fundamentals application teaches Magic Leap to users all about the new AR paradigms, things like augment, um, uh, sorry, world understanding, hand tracking, and this helps users learn how to navigate our operating system and you know, perform really simple functions, but also gives them a primer on what this new medium is all about. I also have to say, this app was not built overnight. We didn't just ship it. We could have, we totally could have, but we took our time and you know, this is the result of a lot of months and a lot of iterations from a really talented team. Some of y'all are in here. Uh, but also a very in-depth attention to user research. So we really did go through the entire design build process, you know, where it's really messy at the beginning and then it gains clarity through more testing. Um, and that's why we have Rocio here uh, to tell us all about that. I'm excited to show this to you guys, first time we show it publicly. So, the Fundamentals app, uh, we really pushed the medium to its fullest potential. We looked at all the affordances of XR, 
So you'll notice, you know, we thought about um, using actual 3D content. You know, it is a, um, we didn't just focus on like panels and, and basics. We really thought about, okay, XR is really exciting. Let's, you know, push it to the fullest. Um, but we also thought about um, bringing in, you know, hand nudges. We know that ghost nudges are really effective. Uh, Ultraleap, totally looking to you at that. Um, we use spatial audio. We really thought about um, the materials that we were using. Um, we used the friendliest AI voiceover that we could find. No, nothing robotic sounding. Uh, so we did a lot. And um, yeah, we're excited to get this shipped and, and running. Oh, wait, hold on. Nope, there we go. Okay. So through the process of building this app and researching XR beginners, we uncovered these five best practices for designing any XR app. And these lessons, as you'll see, they'll elevate any immersive experience that you design and encourage new users to continue engaging more with your technology. So first, beginners learn best by doing. And it's not just about doing things, it's not just about interactive things, but it's about interactive things that are relevant and in context to what they would see later on. So, you know, we thought we could use abstract ways to teach concepts and, you know, kind of get really gamified with it, and, and we did, but when you go too far on the abstract sense, then you're kind of losing the essence of what you're trying to teach, and what we saw was that the skills, they didn't translate well into the real use cases with our OS. So our solution was to make lessons a lot more literal and a lot more relevant to what they'd be seeing outside the app. So when we first designed this learning app, we wanted to make things as engaging and cool as possible. And our designers, like Pedro here, jumped at the opportunity to let their creativity run wild. And they built these you know, teaching modules that um, were very imaginative, right? Like our original idea was that everything we build in 3D space starts with a point. And then we had users selecting points to make lines and then lines to create 3D objects. And it was this incredible idea that was really fun to use um, you know, and taught basic UI interactions in inventive ways. But what we saw through user research was that um, although users were having a fun experience and you know, they had this you know, great you know, experience with this abstract concept, the skills like hand tracking or using the controller that we wanted them to learn, they didn't translate well or solidly into the real use cases in the OS. So basically the learning wasn't sticking and that was the whole point of the experience. So we found that new users actually learned best through in-context modules that leveraged the relevant UI, the actual UI of our OS. And taking these insights, we kind of had to put our ego aside and the designers had to kind of have that heartbreak moment of everything that they built kind of had to be scrapped. And we recreated all these activities with actual UI elements from our OS. Um, and then, you know, after pivoting to this new design direction, we kept iterating, we retested it, we redesigned it until we saw notable improvements in users' learnings. Because after all, that was the goal. You don't want to just build something cool, you want to build something that works, right? So the takeaway is that while incorporating practical UI elements might feel boring or plain from a design perspective sometimes, it is crucial to instilling confidence in new users. Our second insight Ooh, that was loud. is that familiarity always wins in a new paradigm. So users just naturally, um, sorry, we recommend that users, that we <laughs> lean into users' natural inclinations um, and use elements that are familiar to them or gestures. So something like um, indirect hand rate is really hard to teach, but something simple like, you know, touching a button, like a touch screen, is, requires a lot less coaching. This pillar became crucial um, as we were designing and thinking about the default um, distance and behavior of our application. So one of the very primary tasks that users have to do when launching this application is selecting a module. And to give a little bit more context, um, up until we had started working on this application at all, our whole system had been designed and optimized for far field interaction with a controller. 
So just selecting things with the laser or ray. But as hand tracking became more of a customer requirement and became an industry norm, we had to think about, well, how do we design a menu system that not only caters to controller interaction, far interaction, but also caters to different learning, learning capabilities of users. And so one of our first tests um, is, is this GIF right here. Uh, we noticed that users just instinctually knew how to poke something, and then they launched the menu. So we're like, okay, well, that works. And so we kind of took this insight and applied it to our entire application. And so most of our application has a certain tethered follow behavior so that you can you know, still interact with it from afar, but also go up to it and poke it. And so the lesson here is you know, design for users that know least, and you'll be able to tackle a lot of different cases and learning styles. <clears throat> exactly. Third, repetition and redundancy are essential to building muscle memory in beginners. So yeah, so first time users must build their muscle memory and they do this through repetition in task and redundancy in instruction. In a new medium, ensuring, uh, repeating the same tasks ensures that concepts can stick. So what you're seeing here is what we call the cube assembly task. And basically in this activity, users have to build a structure with these 3D cubes that are floating around in their space. And we found that this very simple but repetitive task was actually the perfect way to get users to repeatedly practice the pinch gesture that we taught them previously. And uh, the cherry on top to this is that since users have an objective, they're not just feeling like they're repeating something for the purpose of practice, but it actually feels like you know they're, they're building something for a purpose. So along with repetitive tasks like this one, you can switch the side, uh, we also drive concepts home with what we're calling redundant multimodal guidance. So in this app, we took advantage of all of our devices' capabilities. So spatialized audio, spatial mapping, you know, highly vivid 3D animations, everything that we could find, we really put it in here to get at instruction from every possible angle. So for example, when we teach how to manipulate 3D content, you know, during the lessons, we use a combination of voiceover, 3D ghost hand nudges, like you see here, um, completion state audio cues, text instructions, literally everything that you could imagine, obviously striking the right balance so it doesn't feel like too much. But this all-encompassing instruction ensures that you cover all kinds of learning styles for any user with any background. So for concepts to really stick, we recommend that users practice tasks repeatedly to build muscle memory and also receive redundant instructions. Okay, our fourth insight is that new users have tunnel vision. We recommend actually um, widening the scope of their view, quite literally, actively get them to look past their field of view, encourage them to walk around, experience content in their space. Otherwise, they're just gonna look at what's directly in front of them. This GIF on this slide actually always makes Rocio laugh. Uh, it's from one of the earlier uh, user studies, you know, the one that she was describing, where we were all excited and we were like designing really inventive things and like we hadn't tested anything. Uh, it's the final moment in our introduction to augmented reality module uh, where the user is uh, noticing a cube explode onto a wall and this teaches the user that the camera can detect the environment and there's content bouncing all around and there's like a beautiful shader that is gorgeous. Um, but as you can see, the user is just like staring straight and like totally misses the mesh reveal. Um, and this is because they were waiting for a voice instruction to tell them what to do. And this is exactly what we mean by tunnel vision. So our mistake here was that up until this point, this is the final one, we had kind of conditioned them to listen for voice instruction before they could take any action. And so they didn't feel confident the whole way to even step outside of any of that instruction that we had laid out. And so from this, uh, this is like a first user study. Uh, we revised our entire instruction approach and we made sure that since the very beginning we laid out different uh, steps for the user to actually explore a little bit. Um, there, was a, there was a balance between you know, being very prescriptive and then also being exploratory. So getting the users to walk around, um, like telling them to walk around, telling them in many ways to walk around, uh, showing content, using audio cues, 
so that by the time they got to this final step, they didn't miss the mesh reveal. And so the takeaway is to have a good balance of prescriptive and exploratory instruction. And that way you'll get your user to not only finish the journey, but actually build confidence by the end. Great. And finally, any complexity needs clear explanation. It's really important to instill a strong knowledge base in your users so that they can troubleshoot their own experiences later on when they're not in a tutorial app or when they can't go back to the tutorial app. Too often we assume that sugarcoating things or simplifying, right, omitting information that we might think is too technical, we think that that will help. Uh, but instead, this can actually make technical concepts more confusing. So for example, asking a user to select a virtual button with a controller might seem like extremely simple, right? Just point and click. After all, um, many people that use our device have already used some kind of controller before, whether in video games or whatever. Um, but we actually found that uh, people's experiences with controllers differ greatly. So some people have no familiarity, while others have way too much to the point of having built habits with them. So in order to kind of counteract people with habits and too much knowledge, but also cater to the people that have no knowledge or you know, confounding information, we found that it actually took a lot of work to find kind of the, the perfect balance between too little and too much. So at first, in our controller module, we tried to keep things really simple and only teach people the buttons that they needed to know on the controller to point and click on something. Uh, but we found that um, this inadvertently caused more confusion because by isolating certain buttons on the controller, you can see we have a lot, it made people more curious about the other buttons and then it kind of caused a, like a paralysis where they didn't want to click any button at all just in case because they didn't know what the other ones did and they would forget which is the one that you told me to click. So it was kind of disastrous, right? They just didn't want to use it at all. So our solution was that we created a step-by-step -step overview of what each button does on the controller before asking users to interact with it at all. So you see it says one out of 19 screens here. This might seem like a lot. It felt like overkill at first for us or like we were taking way too long to get to the fun part. Um, but by adding this explanation, we found that we struck the right balance between giving people too little information and too much. After all, if they know everything, they could just skip through. So it does give users just enough practice now. They get instructions on what each button does, and then they get this simultaneous tooltip that appears on the controller itself if you look straight at it. And the result was a very quick learning process that teaches users you know, how to interact with the controller, makes them feel confident with it, right? You get you know, that whole scared feeling out of the way for them, and they feel at least a little bit knowledgeable enough so that they know generally what they need to do with it by the time they get to the tasks. So we discovered that it was crucial to not only show users what to do, but also to explain and give context to what they're seeing so that they can move forward feeling more confident and more knowledgeable. Users must get a sense of how features work and like why they need to do things a certain way because sometimes when you tell people this is how it works, but you don't tell them why it works like that, they just wanna do it in the way that they think is best. So you really want to explain like, it works like this because of this reason. And if you don't do it this way, this other thing will happen. But you know, without saying too much, you need to give you know, the right amount of information so that people can self-correct their behaviors later on. So um, when the goal is to take every beginner to a lifetime adopter, there really are no shortcuts. You really have to put in the work if you want to make something successful. And our checklist is a guide for any XR creator to take inspiration from, no matter what kind of experience you're designing. And I'm sure everyone in this room wants to build the next big thing. So if you do, really keep in mind these crucial best practices that we kind of learned the hard way. And I wish somebody had just told us this from the beginning. So number one, uh, beginners learn best by doing through interactive modules that uh, leverage relevant UI. So don't make things too abstract, at least not in the beginning, so that people can have, have kind of like a hand-holdy feeling. So when they get to the real thing, they're not like, okay, this looks totally different. Uh, second, lean into the familiar as much as possible so novice users can feel less intimidated with new paradigms. Third, repetition in task and redundancy in instruction are essential to instilling confidence in new users and feel free to capitalize on all the bells and whistles of your technology to really get at every possible um, learning style. Fourth, address new users' tunnel vision by encouraging exploration early on, really broaden their scope 
so they don't feel scared to kind of do things on their own later. And finally, use clear explanations for complex topics. Try to just say things like they are so that people don't feel confused about what you're trying to say under all the sugar coating. Um, so incorporate these five best insights to level up your experience and create confident and knowledgeable users. With intuitive um, and thoughtful UX, we will advance what's possible for XR. What comes next is exciting, but it's up to us designers, researchers, developers, whoever else is in the room, it's really up to us to create experiences that people um, feel comfortable joining, right? Lead people on the path ahead for people who aren't in this industry already. And so, you know, we're all excited about the future of this technology, but we have to keep front and center that the way we build this experiences will be the gateway for how people experience XR. And if you have like a business mindset or a money-making mindset, you have to build these things correctly so people actually come back to the technology and they want to buy more and they want to share it with people. Thank you all for your attention. Um, we would love for you guys to check out our fundamentals demo in booth 407, so please come by. And yeah, if you want to keep connecting, uh, reach out to us on LinkedIn. My name is Jesse Escobedo and Rocio Sergio. Thank you.